Good afternoon and welcome to the Boise Metro Chamber CEO Speaker Series featuring John McCready, President and CEO of Amalgamated Sugar. I'm Tom Mortel, Chair of the Boise Metro Chamber Board of Directors and a partner at the law firm of Holly Troxell. Before we join, hear from John, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event. This event is presented by Bank of America. Our sponsors are Blue Cross of Idaho, Holly Troxell, the Idaho Business Review, Regents Blue Shield of Idaho, Stoll Reeves, and United Heritage Insurance. Our event contributors are Boise State University. I would like to now introduce you to Aaron Dykus, resident director with Merrill Lynch, a Bank of America company who will introduce our featured speaker. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to the rest of the Boise Metro Chamber team for this great partnership to deliver another CEO speaker series presentation. I'm Aaron Dykus, resident director of the Boise Merrill Lynch office and a member of the Bank of America Idaho leadership team. For more than 230 years, Bank of America and Merrill Lynch have played a critical role in developing the U.S. and the global economy. We're here to tackle what matters most to the people and the communities we serve by listening to their needs and providing the guidance and resources that can help them do and achieve more. We're honored to partner with the Boise Metro Chamber, who continues to promote the community vitality and economic prosperity of our region. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, John McCready. John has been the president and CEO of the Amalgamated Sugar Company and president of Snake River Sugar Company since May 1st, 2015. He graduated from the University of Idaho College of Law in 1987. John was Deputy Attorney General for the State of Idaho from 1988 to 1992, and then he ran a successful private law practice until 2004 when he joined Amalgamated Sugar. John's work at Amalgamated Sugar focuses primarily on the development and implementation of the company's vision and strategy, and the acquisition and deployment of the talent necessary to implement the company's strategic goals. John's a member of the Board of Directors of the Sugar Association, Inc., and a trustee of the United States Beet Sugar Association, Inc. He also served on the Idaho Board of Environmental Quality from 2014 until 2018. He's a busy guy. John, we appreciate you taking time today and we look forward to your perspective and your insights. Welcome. Thank you, Aaron, very much. Uh, thank you, Tom. I'm honored to be asked to speak at the Boise Chamber series uh, for CEOs. Uh, last week, a good friend of mine who's a business leader here in Boise uh, sent me an email saying, wow, the Chamber's really having to dig deep for speakers. I told him, well, he eventually got to get to the bottom of the list sometime. But seriously, uh, I feel very fortunate to be asked to be uh, share a little bit about myself, but more importantly about uh, our company. Um, we've kept kind of a low profile here in Boise since 2004. That's changing a bit. Uh, we're actually 120 years old. Uh, we have about, about 75 people who are located in uh, our corporate office here in Boise. It's located over by the Goodwood Barbecue and by Costco. Uh, I like to tell people I have a stunning view of the Costco car wash. Uh, but I do want to thank our sponsors, Bank of America, BCI, Holly Troxel, uh, Idaho Business Review, Regents Blue Shield of Idaho, Stoll Reeves, United Heritage, uh, in particular BSU for being willing to sponsor a Vandal, uh, and St. Luke's. So I wanted to start a little bit uh, uh, because I think for me it's all about family, uh, so I'll share just a little bit of background. Um, I come from a large family of six children. Uh, my mom and dad uh, were domestic nomads. Uh, my dad was a civil engineer, my mom a school teacher, and they traveled all around the United States to 13 different locations while they were raising six kids. Uh, my mom used to leave the stickers on our furniture, the moving van stickers on our furniture, because she didn't want to have to put new ones on in two years when we moved again. Uh, but we had a very loving, very, very supportive family. Uh, we lived for about five years north of Boston, and when you tell people that, they say, well, you're East Coast, you had a big family, you must be Catholic. And then they moved to Idaho in 1978. And so when you tell people, well, you live in Idaho and you have a big family, you know, of course, what they're going to say. You, 
you must be LDS. What I tell people is mom and dad just really loved each other a lot. <laughs> so I have been here in Idaho since 1978. Uh, you can see in the picture the lovely woman with the glasses on. That's my wife, Julie. We've been married for about 24 years. Uh, she's the lighthouse of the family. Uh, I have four children. Uh, a couple of them have been married, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, and then the young man down in the middle of the picture, that's Ethan. Uh, our family story includes a little bit of tragic loss. Ethan passed away about six years ago, and I think that's helped shape our family uh, and shape me individually as a human being. Uh, as uh, you heard in the introduction, I'm a University of Idaho grad. Uh, I started in 1987 after law school as a clerk for Judge Dan Hurlbut, uh, working on the Snake River Basin adjudication. I was very privileged after that to work for both Larry Echohawk and Jim Jones. Uh, Jim became my mentor for many years, and I went to work for Jim. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work at the Attorney General's office for Governor Andrus uh, when we were doing nuclear waste litigation. Uh, trying to keep Colorado nuclear waste out of the state of Idaho, and I had a hand in that and was very fortunate to be given those opportunities. Since being at Amalgamated in 2004, I've worked on uh, all variety of things, sugar and sugar company, uh, human relations, uh, labor relations, governance, uh, board decision-making and structure, business development, uh, company reorganization, and then, of course, in the last six years as president and CEO. I want to spend a little bit of time laying some foundation about what Amalgamated is and what it's all about. It's an old company. It's been around since 1897 when a number of sugar beet factories in the Pacific Northwest and really in the Intermountain West were amalgamated together to form one company. And that's where the name come from. comes from. Since then, a lot of op the operations have been consolidated into three core processing factories. You're all familiar probably with the Nampa factory. Uh, some of us drive by it every day. Um, it was built in 1942. We have two older factories that you're perhaps less familiar with. One's in Twin Falls. It was built in 1916. One is uh, what we call the Mini Casha factory. It's located near the little town of Paul, Idaho, also in the Magic Valley. Uh, and it was constructed in 1917. I'll get back to our factories here in a minute. We have 700 growers. Those 700 growers all own one share at least of sugar beet stock. We have some very large growers who own many thousands of shares. And we also have some very smaller growers who have uh, equally important uh, operations. Uh, we like to say every sugar beet's a good sugar beet for us. But every one of those growers, no matter large or small, they have one thing in common, and it's the foundation of our company. They all have one vote. We are a one-member, one-vote agricultural cooperative, and that is one of the fundamental rules of an agricultural cooperative, is every member, no matter size, has one vote. I like to think of our company as kind of like a little bit of a mini government. We have a 25 member board of directors and that board of directors is elected by the voting members, those 700 voting members who are active producers and they elect a director for their voting district or a number of directors for their voting districts. So the members have a direct say in who sits on the board and the board of course has a supervisory authority over management and the company. This fairly large board we have, 25 member board, you might think that's a little big, might be a little unwieldy at times, but we make it work. And in fact, I think we make it work very well. The board has divided itself up into working committees and each one of those working committees has a charter and each one of those working committees is assigned tasks. And then we have subcommittees even within those committees. So whether it's drafting a new grower agreement or determining how many acres we're gonna plant each year or pushing a new beet payment formula out, which is the way we pay our growers to incentivize certain behavior in our growers. It all ends up resting with those committees and with the board, and the board has a very active role in, ru in running the company. We have 1,700 employees. Uh, about 350 of those are salaried. Uh, the rest of them are hourly employees or seasonal employees. Uh, the hourly employees, we have about 1,100 unionized employees, so we're one of the few companies in Idaho that actually negotiates a collective bargaining agreement, and they typically last uh, really three to four years. 
We're the second largest beet sugar company in the United States. Believe it or not, right here in Idaho, we make about 10% of the nation's real sugar. Our sugar is marketed by a company called National Sugar Marketing. It's an organization that a, a few of us helped create about 10 years ago. And that's a marketing alliance with a couple of other domestic producers. We have an extensive feed products business. We are about a 900 to $950 million a year company. And of all that gross revenue, our feed products business, pulp, betaine, and other feed products makes up about 80 to $90 million. Want to just give you some basics about the United States sugar industry. This is a map of all the beet sugar factories and all the cane sugar raw mills and refinery mills. And you can see in Idaho, those three green, those three red dots, uh, that's us. That's the amalgamated sugar company. But the heart of sugar beet country in the United States is often referred to as the Red River Valley. It's there on the border between Minnesota uh, and North Dakota. That's where the largest sugar beet company in the United States is located and a number of other companies. Also have a pretty significant beet sugar uh, uh, group in Michigan Sugar Company. Believe it or not, in the United States, Americans consume about 12 million tons of real sugar, what I call sucrose, each year. Of that 12 million tons, about 5 million tons is produced by beet sugar companies. The other 7 million tons, about 4 million of that is grown in the United States, in Louisiana, Florida, and Texas. It's grown as raw sugar and then processed into refined sugar at the cane refineries. And then the other 3 million tons is imported raw and refined. Uh, that imported raw is also processed in those cane refineries. So the United States has a very strong domestic sugar industry. Uh, and we have about 30% of the sugar in the United States is from imports. So I think Alex and Connor, who have been very gracious with their time the last few days with me, uh, are going to play a little video. This is of our mini cache factory, and it gives you an overview of how sugar is made from sugar beets. Welcome to Amalgamated Sugar's Minicaja Factory, one of the largest sugar beet processing facilities in the world. Originally constructed in 1917, the Minicaja Factory has evolved as new technology has been developed and capacity has increased. Today, the factory is capable of processing 21,550 tons of sugar beets a day for a total of 3.85 million tons during a campaign. This is equivalent to processing approximately 20 acres of sugar beets every hour for 200 days. The Minicaja factory will produce approximately 3 million pounds of sugar a day, year-round, using the sugar extracted from the sugar beets during campaign. Sugar beets enter the factory through a flume, which washes the beets, removing dirt and debris before they're sliced. A rotary rock catcher removes heavy materials from the water and sugar beets. After being washed, the sugar beets make their way to the hopper, where they wait to be cut into french fry looking strips called cossettes. The cossettes are placed in a diffuser, which uses hot water to soak the sugar out of the sugar beet, using diffusion. The cossettes remain in the diffuser for roughly an hour. The liquid that remains after soaking the sugar beet cossettes in hot water is called raw juice. After most of the sugar has been diffused, the sugar beet still has a purpose. Now called wet pulp, the cossettes are pressed, dried, and sold as cattle feed. The raw juice, which contains the sugar, is sent to carbonation, where milk of lime and carbon dioxide are used to purify the juice. Impurities in the raw juice are removed using clarifiers and filters. The juice is now called thin juice and looks like tea. We will also soften the thin juice using equipment similar to a home water softener. Softening the thin juice prevents the buildup of hard water scale in the evaporators and other heating equipment. The system used to soften the thin juice was developed by our subsidiary company, Amalgamated Research LLC. The thin juice is concentrated using multiple thick evaporators and is now called thick juice, which looks like maple syrup. 
Thin juice is approximately 80% water, while thick juice is about 30% water. The Minicaja factory produces approximately 2,500 gallons of distilled water per minute from the evaporators. This water is called condensate. Thick juice goes one of two places, either to the sugar end of the factory to be crystallized into sugar, or into large storage tanks to be crystallized later during the juice campaign. On the pan floor of the factory, thick juice is enriched with raw sugars in the high melter and filtered. The liquid is now called standard liquor. The standard liquor is further concentrated in large vacuum pans until there is not enough water to keep the sugar dissolved. At this point, a small amount of ground sugar crystals called fondant is injected into the vacuum pan as seed, so the sugar crystals start to grow the appropriate size. After the sugar crystals reach the correct size, a centrifugal machine is used to separate the remaining liquid from the sugar crystals. From this point, the sugar is dried, cooled, weighed, and sent to storage. Sugar is moved to large storage silos where it awaits shipment. This particular silo is 116 feet in diameter and 90 feet high. That is as tall as a seven-story building. There are three silos of this size at the Minicaja factory, and each can hold 40 million pounds of sugar. The remaining syrup is crystallized two more times, producing raw sugars that are used to enrich thick juice into standard liquor. The final syrup is called molasses. At our Twin Falls and Nampa factories, molasses is processed through large chromatography columns called separators to capture any remaining sugar and another sugar beet byproduct called betaine. This recovery process was also developed by Amalgamated Research, LLC. From storage, the sugar is classified into various granulation sizes by passing through a series of screens and then packaged. While the Minicaja factory produces some sugar that is packaged for retail, most of the sugar made in this factory is shipped in bulk for commercial use. This sugar leaves the factory in trucks and rail cars and is used as an ingredient in candy, baked goods, beverages, and other products. The majority of Amalgamated Sugar's retail packaging happens at our Nampa factory. Amalgamated Sugar is a leader in sustainable food production. We release 49% less greenhouse gases and use 29% less fossil fuel energy per bag of sugar than we did 20 years ago. We are committed to operating with the environment, community, and our employees in mind. We hope you've enjoyed learning more about how sugar is produced at Amalgamated Sugar. If you would like to learn more about our company, please visit AmalgamatedSugar.com. The Amalgamated Sugar Company. So thank you, Alex and Connor. Uh, if any of you ever want a tour of any of our factories, just uh, give us a give us a buzz, and we'd be happy to walk you through. Our factories are a heavy industrial food manufacturing facilities. It's quite a large experiment in uh, the chemistry of sugar. Uh, lots and lots of pumps and valves and vessels and equipment, and it's actually a fairly fascinating process. So I want to take a, a few minutes and talk about our mission, our vision, and how we put those into action. Our mission is to produce real sugar for the informed consumer and improve the economic experience for our member growers and employees. And our vision is to do that using the most technologically advanced and in the, in the most socially responsible manner. So let's do a little bit of real sugar education here and make sure we are on the same page. Sugar is a simple carbohydrate, it's sucrose. It's one molecule of glucose bound to one molecule of fructose. It's a carbohydrate, uh, and I think any dietitian will tell you, you have to have carbohydrates, you have to have fat, you have to have protein, you have to have some form of sugar in order for your body to function and your brain to function. Sugar's function in food is more than just sweetness. Certainly it's there to help mask bitter flavors and to allow us to consume nutrient dense foods, but it's also there for viscosity, for texture, for browning. There's no other product I think known to mankind, and this is the position of the D industry, that can do all these functions as well as sugar. 
Of course, you're all aware that sugar's gotten a bad rap. There's a relentless attack on sugar as a bad product. Our position as a company and as an industry is that by practicing moderation and portion control and not depravity, there's room for an appropriate amount of sugar in a healthy diet. If you want to learn more about our position as an industry, you can go to sugar.org. If you want to study the federal dietary guidelines, which recommend that the appropriate amount of sugar is 10% uh, of your calories should come from added sugars, uh, you can go to the dietaryguidelines.gov. Happy to talk to anybody about that. What do we mean by informed consumers? What we want consumers to understand is our position. It's better to use real sugar than artificial sweeteners or some other product as long as you focus on your total cal caloric intake and as long as you focus on having a balanced diet with plenty of exercise. There's room for pie. There's room for ice cream. There's room for the flavors that nature gave us. What there's not room for, as this chart shows, is to continue to consume ever increasing quantities of calories and not get the exercise necessary to burn off those calories. In the last 40 years, our average diet is up 400 calories a day. And I think we all know that a lot of our exercise nowadays is done with our thumb on our phones and we do a lot more sitting now than we did 40 years ago. And our advice to folks is we have to reduce that trend. We've got to exercise better portion control and we've got to exercise more. So let's turn and talk about this phrase, the economic experience for our growers and our employees. Our battle cry is the beet payment. That is the way we pay our growers for their, grower, uh, for their sugar beets. And that is what we focus on, what we wake up every morning focused on is how do we improve the beet payment for our growers? We are essentially a pass-through company. We purchase the sugar beets from our growers. We turn that into sugar and other products. We sell those products. We pay our expenses. We pay for capital improvements, and we have a very robust capital improvement program because, as you know, our factories are old, and we have a lot of work to do in order to modernize them. But at the end of the day, all that's left over goes to our growers. Okay? When we withhold from our growers the amount of money we need for capital improvements, and that's in the range of 50 to $60 million of improvements we make every year to our factories, uh, we issue them a retain. It's also called a book credit. That's a form of equity. And we pay that form of equity back over time. We revolve it in what's called a revolving equity or revolving book credit program. One other way we track how well we're doing is our share value that our growers have. I like to think of share values is, is the relative value of sugar beets to other crops that our growers could grow. For me, the definition of profitability for our company is are we putting enough money in our growers' pockets for them to want to continue to grow sugar beets year after year after year? Uh, that's probably the most underlying mission that we have is to keep our growers in sugar beets. And when share value is good, that's an indication that beets, compared to other crops that they could grow, are still retaining very good value in the Idaho economy, in the Eastern Oregon economy, and in the area where we have shares up near Prosser, Washington. And in that regard, we've had a lot of success in the last several years, making sure our growers' share value is strong. When we talk about our employees, it's important to understand we have a really diverse skill set at Amalgamated. We've got electrical engineers, chemical engineers, civil engineers, process engineers. Uh, heck, we even have recovering attorneys like me. Uh, we've got accountants, we've got all types of skill sets, we've got uh, mechanics, we've got electricians, we've got carpenters. I think if you name it, we've probably got one. Uh, and so we have developed a tremendous amount of in-house expertise. We generally design and oversee most of our capital improvement projects as opposed to what some of the other companies do. Uh, farming them out to contractors. I'm not saying one's better than the other. What I do know is what we're comfortable with, and that is we are very hands-on on these factories in terms of our capital improvement programs. We are a long-term career path. We have a number of 40-year employees. It's not uncommon for an employee to work for our company for 42, 43 years, to start at the very bottom as a general laborer, to work their way up, 
uh, through the union ranks to become a foreman, then to become a salaried supervisor. Uh, we provide excellent competitive pay and benefits. And so we really pride ourselves on our ability to keep our tribe and keep our members of our tribe together. We have extensive safety and other training for our employees. Uh, we place a real premium on safety and we've driven our overall safety performance numbers uh, down uh, very, very well over the last three, uh, three, four years with a heavy emphasis on safety. In terms of the portion of our vision of being technologically advanced, I do think we are the most technologically advanced sugar beet company in the United States. We are industry leaders in both yield and sugar content. Because we're in an arid, dry, a high desert type climate, and we rely heavily on irrigation, we're able to moderate our yield very, very well, and we consistently produce a 40 ton crop a year. We've also had tremendous success the last few years in the way we pay our growers and in the way we do seed development to improve our over sugar con overall sugar content. Beets have about 17 to 20% sugar in them. And if you're an 18% sugar company, which we, I believe, have become in the last few years, you're doing extremely well. There's a lot of value in that one point of sugar content from 17 to 18%. We have a very KPI and metric-driven, numbers-driven company. Uh, we publish our overall stats for slicing beets and granulating sugar on a very regular basis. And we compensate our employees with incentive pay for hitting those numbers, uh, and we've improved that practice over the last few years. I think we're an industry leader in extraction. If you can get 82, 83% sugar out of that sugar beet when it's delivered to the factory, now that's probably the norm in the industry. The technology we've de developed at ARI, Amalgamated Research, the separation technology, has allowed us, along with a number of other participants in the industry, to raise that extraction rate up to more like 90, 91%, uh, and that's provided a tremendous amount of additional revenue. So finally, in terms of social responsibility, we take a tremendous pride in our environmental footprint. In the last 25 years, we've produced 63% more sugar per acre a lot of that is the use of genetic engineering and improved agricultural husbandry. Uh, in the last 20 years, our growers have applied 85% fewer pesticides and 60% less diesel fuel per ton of beets. Again, that is the result of genetic engineering. Our seeds that we grow are genetically modified. Our sugar that's produced has all DNA removed, and so there is no evidence of genetic engineering in the actual product. That's a very, very unique attribute of our technology uh, that we've enjoyed in this industry. We incentivize, we pay our growers to deliver sugar beets with fewer nitrates and to reduce the overall impact on uh, soil and groundwater. We are, again, I think an industry leader in decreasing farm to factory losses. What that phrase is about is when sugar beets are put in these large storage piles uh, that some of you may have seen in the countryside, those are receiving stations. They respirate, they lose sugar. Uh, we've not only pioneered, but we've perfected to some degree the use of cooling systems to keep those beets cool and to preserve that sugar. And the more sugar that ends up in the bag, the lower your environmental footprint. And so we take great pride in working very, very hard on that part of our business. And then of course, in the last few years, uh, as some of my friends have commented and colleagues, we've done a much better job of raising our community profile uh, contributing to food banks and contributing uh, in the last year 36 tons of sugar during COVID uh, to charitable causes. So kind of to wind up a little bit, just a few comments about our management style and some of our leadership lessons at Amalgamated. We have a very um, value-based leadership style. Uh, what I like to tell people is an organization is just an excuse to have a series of relationships, and I don't know that it really matters what type of organization that is, but for us, those relationships have to be trustworthy, they have to be healthy, they have to be strong, uh, people have to be free to speak their mind, to disagree respectfully, to debate and deliberate until you find a common solution. Uh, one of my favorite phrases is, it's not a question of who's right, it's a question of what's right. Or another way to say that is, would you rather be right or effective? 
And so we place a lot of emphasis on uh, more of kind of a moral, ethical groundwork for how we make our decisions. Uh, and we often ask the question, what would a good company do? I think with that type of value-based leadership, we also spread our decision-making horizontally as far and wide as we can. Uh, the example I like to give employees is if we have a meeting and I take all the footballs back to my office and say, I'll figure it out and I'll talk to you later, that's been an, a very unsuccessful meeting in my opinion. Uh, what we like to do is we like to give employees ownership over the problem, ownership over the process to solve the problem, and ownership over the structure they're going to use to get to the right conclusion. Uh, and then I think from there, my primary job is to step back and guide to the best of my ability. We have a very inclusive and collaborative structure. Uh, we spend a lot of time in committee meetings. Sometimes it can feel exhaustive, uh, but finding the right solution and the right answer to some of the problems we face takes a lot of hands-on work and it involves a lot of work with our board. Uh, in the picture here, you can see my board chairman, Mike uh, Garner. Uh, we work very hard on having a very strong and very communicative relationship. Uh, I spend a lot of time over communicating to make sure everybody understands what's going on in the company. Probably don't do that as well as I could, uh, but I sure try hard on it. Uh, we emphasize structure and process a lot more than we emphasize results. The results tend to take care of themselves. And we have a penchant for revisiting things kind of over and over again until we get it right. When you're changing policies that impact 700 growers at a time, you can imagine there's some resistance along the way. So we like to ease into those long-term policy changes, do it in phases, uh, get pieces of that puzzle out, and then revisit along the way. I'll close with a phrase that's from a book about the history of amalgamated sugar. Uh, this was a bit of a mantra from a fellow named H.A. Benning from the 1950s, uh, and his battle cry, if you will, is the difficult will be done at once, uh, the impossible will take a little longer. For a 120-year-old company to still be around today, I think that's kind of how we look at the world. We're going to do it if it's hard. We're going to do it if it's really hard. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about our company and uh, would welcome any questions. Thanks, John. That was that was great. We appreciate the opportunity to learn so much uh, about uh, your facility and your company, and we wish you the best in, in being successful. We do have some questions that I'd like to, to pose to you. And the first one is, is what's, what is it about Idaho that makes it so suitable for sugar beet production? And give us a little bit of the history of sugar beets in Idaho. Well, again, sugar beets have been around in Idaho since the turn of the century. I think our competitive advantage at this point is our climate, uh, first and foremost. Uh, again, we're high desert, we're irrigated, we're low disease, we're low humidity, uh, and we're able to kind of target our tonnage and target our sugar content uh, as well as any other company, probably better than any other company out there. And that gives us a really consistent supply of sugar beets. And that gives us the ability to design our capital improvement projects and our, and our uh, factories around targeting a set amount of sugar that we want to produce each year. It allows us to kind of manage our costs as well as we can and, and dial down the vagaries or inconsistencies in the agricultural com uh, e economy and be more targeted and more focused in our strategies. I would, I would also say that what makes us unique is the diversity of our grower base. So in the Treasure Valley, we compete with a lot of crops because the Treasure Valley has a lot of crops grown in this area. In the area that we call the Upper Snake, which is over near ba Aberdeen, there's less competition amongst crops, but in that region, we also have the highest sugar content. So the diversity of our agricultural system and the uh, just the toughness and the steadfast nature of our growers and their willingness to endure the tough years with the good years uh, really gives us a strong platform to compete from. So I think it's about the climate. And I think it's about the growers. and I think it's about the employees, Tom. Thank you, John. That's, that's a great answer. We appreciate that. Uh, a, a lot of people might associate what they know about uh, the sugar factories by what they maybe smell, smell when they drive by. Uh, can you just tell us what you do to uh, 
um, specifically to, to help make sure you're a good steward of our environment? Well, focusing on Nampa, because that's probably the area where um, our odor is the most noticeable. And believe it or not, we have a St. Luke's medical facility, uh, which adjoins our Nampa property now. Uh, we have a target. We have a number of commercial interests. Uh, at that facility, we stopped using coal many years ago to dry our pulp. And instead, we use a steam dryer there. And that was about a $20 million investment, which substantially reduced uh, our odor profile at the facility. Our next step in terms of reducing odor from our condensate water is to design and install an anaerobic digester. That's on the books for the next uh, couple of years and part of our long-term uh, improvement process. That's likely to be a 10 to $15 million investment. Uh, we also have a very strong working group that spends time with the community. Uh, when we have um, odor complaints, uh, we do our best to get after it as quickly as we can and to reduce them. And uh, we also have a, a series of ponds out there that we aerate quite often. So for us, if we're going to continue to have uh, what I call the social license, the ability to continue to operate, we're going to need to continue to invest uh, time, money, energy, capital uh, into reducing our overall environmental footprint at the Nampa facility. Likely the same thing will happen in Twin Falls and into Mini Cash uh, factory over time. So I think it's really good for us to get out ahead at Nampa uh, and to demonstrate our commitment at Nampa first. So uh, I appreciate that. Tell us, tell us what it's like to be part of the agricultural community in Idaho and how do the political issues that, that focus on agriculture affect your company? Um, we, we have a strong agricultural base throughout the state. And uh, uh, sometimes we uh, uh, have political issues that have competing interests. And give us your take on where we are politically as a state from your perspective. Uh, agriculture and politics in Idaho. Is that kind of the nature of the question, Tom? That's the nature of the question. Um, our water rights at our factories are old and pretty well established, and I think our growers have benefited greatly from the adjudication process to establish uh, their priority on water rights. So I don't see us getting too caught up in the politics of water law uh, in the state of Idaho, and we really relatively maintained a neutral stance there. Uh, in terms of transportation, we've been very active in, in wanting to see larger trucks on Idaho's highways. Uh, and it's not just an economic argument, although it is an economic argument to some degree, it's a safety argument. We've been a big proponent of 129,000 pound trucks because we were able to establish through a series of pilot studies that they're safer and less damaging to Idaho's highways. Uh, other than those two issues, we don't get too involved in a lot of the agricultural politics in Idaho. I mean, we're a huge proponent of a very strong transportation system. And so we spend our time uh, focused on making sure we give our contribution and, and support uh, the governor's budget as it relates to uh, continued future improvements to the transportation system. And of course, that's vital to us. Uh, we still do a lot of rail transportation. And so we participate in, in making sure we support the rail transportation system. But uh, I don't want to give the perspective that we're apolitical. We can certainly get involved, but we generally do most of our uh, legislative work is at the federal level, Tom, to be honest. Okay, great. So to tell us about, is your production exclusively from beets grown in Idaho, or do you receive beets from other communities, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, other, other places like the Columbia Basin, places like that? Yeah, so if we go back to this slide here, oh, that's okay. I know you and I are up on the screen. We have a uh, um, roughly 8,600 shares located uh, in eastern Oregon. So that's our Malheur County footprint for the most part. Uh, and they're so connected to the Treasure Valley um, that they're really well integrated into our Nampa facility and a core part of our Nampa facility. We have a pocket of shares up in the LaGrande, Oregon area, and, and uh, it's still a good place for us to grow sugar beets. Uh, good tonnage, good sugar content, very good quality, and uh, we can still make it work in transportation costs, even pulling beets down from LaGrande. Uh, in Washington, up by a little area called Prosser, Washington, we have a couple of thousand shares, and we still grow a couple of thousand acres there. 
Uh, and even then, we can get those beats down here, assuming transportation costs don't balloon too extraordinarily, uh, and make it work and make it profitable, not only for those growers, but for the company. But uh, again, uh, it's common sense. The further you go, uh, the further the transportation costs and the more increases in transportation costs we have, uh, the, the more we end up uh, somewhat having to shrink our overall uh, circumference that you put around a factory in terms of the miles you can transport beets. Thank you. One, one of our listeners uh, is asking whether you see any pain points politically related to transportation or otherwise that, uh, that uh, you could use the chamber's help with or that might be important to your company. I think for the most part, um, with these pilot studies we did on 129,000 pound trucks on both federal and state highways in Idaho uh, and the relationships we've built with uh, county highway districts, we have gotten for the most part past our transportation issues. Uh, and I think it's now back to working on a platform for transportation for all of southern Idaho and where we fit into that platform. Great, thank you. Uh, from Sandy Anderson, we have a question. With so much recent urban development of farmland, are there concerns about the loss of farms and concerns about your producers transitioning their farmland into other uses that aren't agricultural? In the Magic Valley for our Twin Falls and Paul factory, the Minicasha factory, no. I think there's ample farm ground in the Magic Valley for as far as we can see into the future. In the Nampa area, maybe. And not in the next 20 to 30 years from what we can see, but perhaps beyond that window. And that's a, a pressure we're going to have to deal with and a challenge that we're going to have to deal with. And there, it's not sugar beets competing with another crop. It's sugar beets competing with a subdivision or sugar beets competing, competing with a commercial development. Uh, so I think we're good for the next 20, 30 years. And that's the response I get from our growers because we ask our board and our growers the very same question, Tom. Uh, but I would imagine 20, 30 years from now, it's gonna be hard for any of us to fully predict what this valley looks like. Great, thank you. Uh, before we spoke today, uh, before you went, uh, before your, uh, uh, presentation, you and I talked about uh, some of the things we have in common as lawyers, and you you mentioned some of your mentors as a young lawyer. Who have been your mentors as a business leader, and what do you think the best advice is you've received as a business leader? So I'm, I'm asking you maybe to, to focus on your leadership uh, at, at the company and maybe not, not so much what we were talking about before about the legal things we share in common. Thanks, Tom. And it was fun to chat a little bit. Uh, you know, it's it's always been very, very uh, good. And I take great honor and, and uh, feel very fortunate to have been a part of the Idaho legal community for so many years. In terms of the business community, I'm fortunate that I've got a, a very diverse group of board members. Uh, and we've developed a lot of very supportive, uh, very, very trustworthy relationships. And so I'm really lucky to be able to call on a lot of them for uh, critical business advice. And uh, while the size of their businesses may not be the same size as the business I run, some of the problems we face are the same. Uh, and so that's a good source. I had a very good chairman uh, for nine years prior to Mike. I've got a very, very good chairman in Mike. Uh, so that's been helpful. And on occasion, I have tapped into uh, organizations like Corn Ferry for executive leadership advice. Uh, I do a lot of reading of a lot of books on uh, you know, changes in leadership structure and changes in leadership profiles. Um, so I, I try to get my advice from a variety of sources and uh, practice it a little bit to see if, I, if it fits for me and fits for the company. The best advice that I've gotten so far um, probably comes more from practice than from a person and that is for for the type of company that I run, you really have to focus on the structure and the process of decision making and worry less about the result. The result will take care of itself. You have to build a good structure and process for people to deliberate and make high quality decisions. And I think the one pearl that I've been able to extract out of all that is uh, risk management is good decision making. And so I like to use that phrase. Uh, another one is um, 
I like to use the phrase principles before personalities, because I think that emphasizes that you need to let the egos calm down and uh, the emotions kind of subside on difficult issues uh, and really ask yourself, what would a good company do in this situation? So great. That's, that's a great response. I'm sure many in our audience are CEOs and many are board members. How do you find the right balance between uh, board principles of uh, observation and governance versus management principles that the CEO and the management team would have? How do you keep those lines uh, appropriately separate in the right occasions while still getting input one from another? You know, the common phrase is noses in, fingers out for board members, right? Uh, exercise your oversight responsibility without trying to take control of management's job and duties. My own advice is when you feel micromanaged, you might be micromanaged, and it's appropriate to have that discussion with your board. It can be a touchy and difficult discussion, but you should have enough courage to bring the topic up uh, and to ask yourself, um, is my board going too far? Uh, and have that discussion with your board members. And I think for the most part, most good board members welcome that type of interaction. And hopefully most good CEOs are willing to have those tough uh, conversations. So I'm gonna ask you one Absolutely. last thing. I mean, Tom, I want my board heavily involved in running the company because without that, we're not gonna move our growers in a direction that really supports the overall long-term health of the company. It's gotta be a mutually beneficial, very strong relationship. So. Uh, it can be a fine line, but it's a line that should be discussed. Great. Thank you. You, you touched on this a little earlier, but I, I'm going to ask you what your favorite dessert is and how is it sweetened? Favorite dessert is pie. And if I had to choose, it's probably huckleberry or blueberry pie. I love pie. So. And I love sugar overall. Uh, so it's, You can find me in somewhat of a pie comatose at Thanksgiving time. So that's that's where you'll find me on occasion. So. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure any of us need to, to worry too much about those uh, federal guidelines on what we should eat. Um, anyway, thank you so much, John. This has been a wonderful um, uh, experience. And thank you for sharing time with us today. And I'll turn it over to whoever uh, is, is next on our script. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to thank uh, our presenting sponsor, uh, Bank of America, uh, our sponsors, Blue Cross of Idaho, Holly Troxel, Idaho Business Review, Regents Blue Shield of Idaho, Stoll Reeves, and United Heritage Insurance, and our contributing sponsor today, Boise State University. Thank you for being with us for our first uh, CEO speaker series of the new year. We look forward to additional um, uh, speaker series events in the coming year, and hopefully we will be back together soon and be in a position to have these events in person. Uh, so on behalf of the chamber, uh, I'm Tom Mortel, and we are adjourned.